Hi everyone, this is Bob Merberg from Hi Ho. Today I'm trying something a little bit different. You know, I've been experimenting with these AI assisted two person conversations that are based on previous articles I published in Hi Ho. Today, another AI assisted conversation, but this one is based on something a little bit different. It's based on a video that I created called Designing Jobs People Want to Do. Now this video that was used for today's episode was actually a practice session I did. So I'm linking to it in the show notes, but it's pretty rough around the edges. Uh, the presentation was one that I used to do at conferences and for webinars and so forth. You know, at the time, I felt like there is no worker well-being without understanding the work. And I still feel that to a sense, maybe not as stridently, but certainly I think that anyone who is interested in employee well-being, workplace wellness, it warrants at least knowing some fundamental concepts in job design. Because I guess I'm still not sure that we can really do anything about worker well-being just by addressing the worker and neglecting to address the work. With no further ado, here we go. Ever feel like your dream job is trapped inside your real job? <laughs> like if you could just rearrange a few things, you know, find a bit more purpose, it'd be perfect. It's not about finding that mythical perfect job, right? Oh. It's more about recognizing you have more power than you might think to shape the one you've got. And that's what we're diving into today, crafting the work life you actually want. And to guide us through this, we're tapping into the mind of Bob Merberg. Oh, he's great. He's a consultant who spent decades helping companies crack the code on job satisfaction. Yeah, he's all about a research-backed approach. No vague self-help jargon here. <sighs> Ready to dive in? Absolutely. Bob's work cuts through the noise and gets to the core of what makes work meaningful. One of the things that blew my mind was this idea that you can actually measure job motivation. There's a whole formula for it. Yeah, it's called the job characteristics model, but don't worry, we're not going full on academic here. Okay, good. We'll keep it light. No, but it's actually surprisingly intuitive. <laughs> the model boils down to five core characteristics that make work more engaging. Okay. And what's fascinating is that these characteristics, they hold true across industries, whether you're a CEO or, you know, a cashier. So what makes a job truly motivating? Hit us with number one. The first is skill variety. Okay. Think about it. Wouldn't you get bored doing the same repetitive task like day in and day out? Yeah, for sure. Skill variety is about having the opportunity to use different skills and flex different mental muscles in your work. Okay. So more variety, less monotony makes sense. What's next? Number two is task identity, which is all about being able to see a project through from beginning to end. You know that feeling of accomplishment? When you can look at something and say, I built that, I wrote that, I solved that. Oh, yeah. That's task identity. It's like the difference between baking a cake from scratch and just putting on the frosting, right? Yeah. You get that full sense of ownership. Exactly. Accomplishment. And that feeling of ownership is a huge motivator. Mm. Now, the third characteristic is task significance. Mm. This is where it gets really interesting because it's about feeling like your work actually matters, that it has a positive impact on others. This is huge. We all want to feel like our work has meaning beyond just collecting a paycheck. But what does that look like in practice? Not always about saving lives or changing the world in some grand way, right? Sometimes it's about the small, everyday ways you make a difference. Like think about a customer service rep who goes above and beyond to solve, you know, a really tricky problem for a frustrated customer. Yeah. They might not be curing cancer, but they're making someone's day better. And that has real value. Absolutely. And that sense of making a difference, even in small ways, can be incredibly motivating. Okay. We got three down, two to go. What are the final elements yeah. of the motivating job formula? The next one is autonomy. Think about a time you felt micromanaged. 
Not exactly inspiring, right? Uh, Autonomy is the opposite of that. It's about having the freedom and independence to make decisions about your work, to have a say in how you approach your tasks and how you structure your day. Autonomy is huge for me. It's about feeling trusted and respected enough to manage your own work, which is incredibly empowering. Okay, drum roll, please. What's the fifth and final element? The final element is feedback. And I'm not just talking about your annual performance review. It's about receiving regular constructive input on your work so you know how you're doing and where you can improve. Makes sense. It's tough to grow if you're in the dark about what you're doing well and what needs work. Right. But what's really cool about this model is that it's not just some feel-good theory, right? It's backed by hard data. Absolutely. Bob's research and countless other studies have consistently found that when these five elements are present in a job, you see higher levels of employee motivation, engagement, and even better performance. Okay, so we've got this formula for motivating jobs, but how do we actually put it into practice? Can companies really just flip a switch and like transform every job into a dream job? It's not quite as simple as flipping a switch, unfortunately. All right. But there are some concrete steps companies can take to design more motivating jobs, for sure. Give me the deets. What can companies actually do to make work more engaging? Well, Bob talks about a few classic job design techniques that have, you know, stood the test of time. One is job enlargement, which is basically about adding more variety to a role by expanding the number and types of tasks. So it's like taking that repetitive task and like adding some spice to it, mixing things up a bit. Exactly. It's about giving people a chance to use wider range of skills mm -hmm. and preventing them from, you know, feeling stuck in a rut. Which makes total sense because remember that first element of the motivating job formula, skill variety. This directly addresses that. Precisely. Then there's job enrichment, yeah. which focuses more on giving employees more autonomy and responsibility. More freedom and ownership over their work. Sign me up. Right. This could involve giving them more decision-making power, letting them take ownership of projects, or, you know, providing opportunities to develop new skills. Which, if we think back to the formula, lines up perfectly with both the autonomy and feedback elements. You got it. It's about trusting people to manage their own work and giving them the resources and support they need to thrive. And I've actually seen this work firsthand. A while back, I was feeling totally burned out at my old job, so I went to my manager and uh, pitched this idea for a new project, something I was, like, really passionate about. They were a bit hesitant at first, but I managed to convince them to give me a shot. And you know what? It completely turned things around for me. That's fantastic. It's a perfect example of how job enrichment can play out in real life. For sure. It wasn't a complete job overhaul, just a little tweak that made a world of difference. And then there's job rotation, which I'm guessing is about moving people between different roles or tasks. Exactly. Job rotation can be a great way to broaden people's skill sets, expose them to different parts of the business, and, you know, prevent boredom and burnout. It's like cross-training for your career. I love that analogy. Yeah. And Bob emphasizes that all of these approaches, they work best when they're done collaboratively. Meaning the employees should actually have a say in how their jobs are designed. Precisely. In fact, Bob quotes Adam Grant, who says that um, a role designed entirely by someone else is unlikely to ever feel like your dream job. Which makes perfect sense. We all have different strengths, interests, and motivations. What might feel enriching to one person could feel like a total drag to someone else. Exactly. And that's where the idea of job crafting comes in. It's about taking those top-down approaches and like infusing them with a healthy dose of bottom-up initiative. So it's about meeting in the middle, companies creating a supportive structure, and employees taking ownership within that framework. You nailed it. It's a partnership, and it's where things start to get really interesting. So we've talked about what companies can do, but what about those of us who maybe aren't in a position to like right. redesign our entire job descriptions? Right. Is there still hope for us to find more meaning in our work? Absolutely. Yeah. That's where job crafting comes in. Okay. It's about taking ownership and finding those little pockets of joy and purpose, even if your company isn't, you know, making formal changes. Okay. I'm all ears. How do we actually craft our jobs? Where do we even begin? Well... But him highlights some fascinating research on hospital housekeepers. Okay. Now, you, you might think, you know, there's not a lot of wiggle room in a job like that. Yeah. But the researchers found that even in a role that seems, like, pretty defined. Right. There's actually a surprising amount of space for crafting. Really? Yeah. That's encouraging. So how did these housekeepers actually craft their jobs? They used what's called the AR model. Actions, interactions, and reactions. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
I love a good acronym. Break it down for you. So actions are all about tweaking the tasks you do on a daily basis. Okay. This could be something as simple as like changing the order you do things in to, you know, break up the monotony. Right. Or it could be about taking initiative and um, volunteering for a new project that like stretches your skills. So it's about finding ways to like inject a little more variety, challenge, or even just a fresh perspective into your day-to-day work. Exactly. Then there's interactions, which is about how you connect with the people around you at work. Okay. This could mean seeking out mentors to learn from, collaborating with colleagues on different teams to, you know, broaden your horizons, or even just finding small ways to be more present and engaged in your, like, interactions with coworkers. It's like they say, you might not choose your family, but you can choose your friends and your work buddies. Exactly. Mm. And those positive relationships at work can make a huge difference in how you experience your job. Finally, there's reactions, which is all about like shifting your mindset and how you view your work. Okay, so for the hospital housekeepers, this might be about focusing on the fact that they're contributing to a healing environment, even if their tasks are mostly about keeping things clean and organized. Exactly. It's about finding that deeper meaning and purpose in your work, even if it's not you know, immediately obvious. Right. And the researchers found that the housekeepers who engaged in these types of job crafting, they were happier, more satisfied, and felt a stronger sense of purpose in their work. Which brings me back to something you said earlier about that customer service rep. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not saving lives, you're probably making someone's life a little bit easier or better in some way. And sometimes it's just about reminding ourselves of that bigger picture. Absolutely. That shift in perspective can be incredibly powerful. So for our listeners who are ready to start crafting, what are some concrete steps they can take? Well, Bob suggests focusing on a few key areas. First, look for ways to like boost your autonomy. Yeah. This might mean um, speaking up and asking for more ownership over a project or seeking out opportunities to like lead even in small ways. Don't be afraid to advocate for yourself and what you need to thrive. Exactly. Yeah. Second, talk to your manager about your job crafting goals as part of you know your development plan. Yeah. This shows that you're like proactive and invested in your growth. Yeah. And it gives you a chance to get their, you know, buy-in and support. It's about framing it as a win-win. You're more likely to be engaged and productive if you're doing work that like lights you up. Right. And that benefits everyone. Exactly. Yeah. And finally, take some time to really understand the bigger picture of your work. How does what you do contribute to your team's goals, your department's goals, even the overall mission of the company? Because when you can collect those dots, even those like seemingly small tasks can feel more meaningful. It's not just about sending that email. It's about contributing to the success of the team or maybe even making a customer's day. Precisely. And as we wrap up today's deep dive, I want to leave you with this thought. Job crafting isn't a one-time thing. It's an ongoing process. So what's one small action, interaction, or shift in perspective you can experiment with next week to make your work a little bit more engaging and fulfilling? It doesn't have to be a huge overhaul. Just one small step towards crafting a job you love. Love that. Such a powerful reminder that we have more control over our work lives than we often realize. Absolutely. Well, that's all the time we have for today's Deep Dive. 